Thank you, thank you. Hey everyone, who's ready to hear about some exciting new password technology? Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, so today we're gonna be talking about WebAuthn. It's a new technology that's aiming to kind of get rid of passwords on the websites you visit every day. I am Matt South. Alex Lowerman sadly could not be here today. He's still alive, he's just in Colorado. Um, so I'm gonna be kind of blazing through his, his uh, portion of the talk. And like an idiot, I was like, well since he's not giving his slides and I'm gonna blaze through, I'll, I'll do another demo. So I added a, a second demo, which uh, will probably come and bite me in the butt here. So, what, ready, ready to crash and burn. Um, like I said, Matt South, I'm a, he mentioned I'm a pen tester. I work for Trust Foundry and I've been pen testing mostly web apps for about seven years, so. Okay, so we're gonna kind of fly over WebAuthn in three, um, three chapters. We're gonna talk about what's wrong with passwords and why WebAuthn needs to be a thing. We're gonna talk about what WebAuthn is and how it solves some of the problems. And then we're gonna kind of make predictions on what this might mean for the future. Um, okay, so let's start. What's wrong with passwords? Um, the biggest problem with passwords is passwords must be strong, or must be complicated to be strong. Um, a lot of users pick weak passwords, um, but even, even if they do pick a strong password, it's gonna be hard for them to remember it. It's gonna take them more time to type it in to their, to their uh, site that they're visiting. And uh, then there's time wasted for, for uh, IT departments or whoever resetting their passwords when they forget these long, complicated passwords. Uh, all this makes it an easy target for attackers. So we're, we're essentially saying like, hey, Janice in accounting, uh, figure out a really secure password to keep hackers out of our company. So we're putting the responsibility on Janice to, to protect the entire company. And that's not fair. Um, so one solution, let's use passphrases. Who, who's seen the, the correct horse battery staple that I got up here? Okay, so we've all seen it. So that, the idea here is to use a long sentence instead of just a, a, a string of random numbers, you use a sentence of random words, like a correct horse battery staple. Um, issue with that, like they're easier to remember for sure, um, but it still takes forever to type. I, I use these a lot on, on the apps that I visit, and typing, you know, 10 random words into your phone, like, with your, with your keypad sucks. Um, and in 2022, they estimate that there will be, uh, the average internet user will have 207 web accounts. That's a lot. <laughs> like, think of how many correct horse battery staple random sentences you have to remember times 207, that's a lot. Um, and many users, because of these issues, reuse their passwords. And so, raise your hand if you reuse your password everywhere. No, I'm just joking. Don't raise your hand. Uh, I wrote this, like, we, we wrote this talk, you know, 18 months ago. Uh, so I said, a recent tech study in 2018, uh, so it's not that recent anymore, but a Virginia tech study found that 52% of users reuse their passwords. And I, I don't want to admit that I have a couple sites where I reuse mine, but I'm the security guy and I reuse mine. Um, so, um, also, have I been pwned? I hope you guys know about that site. Um, they have 8 billion pwned records as of 20, uh, 2020. There's probably more than that now. Um, so have you been pwned? Yes. Yes, you have. Like, I have, you know, if I go in there and check, I got, you know, 7 or 8, 10 hits or something on there. So, um, all that to say, like, attackers, even if you have a good password, the, the sites you visit might leak your password and get breached. Um, so let's use password managers. Um, right now, this is the best option we have, so I hope that everyone is using a password manager with you know, strong, hard to guess passwords. Um, but this turns password managers themselves into a high value target, so all your eggs are kind of in one basket, so if you have malware on your computer or something, someone gets into your password manager, it's game over for all 207 sites that you're on. And a password manager doesn't protect your password from getting breached from a site. So even if you've got a great password, you've got great hygiene, your, your password could be stored in plain text on the site you visit and then um, the bad guy's got it. So, um, and people can put dumb passwords on their password manager. There's no protection against that. So 
Also, uh, what's wrong with passwords? We can attack them. So as attackers, we like targeting passwords because finding an O-Day in you know, IAS server or something is hard. Guessing Jim's password is easy. Um, and phishing, is phishing still a thing? Yes. Um, according to Verizon report, 32% of breaches involve phishing. And when we have a full red team engagement, that's our go-to. Like, so if, you're, if you hire us to get into your organization, we're gonna send a few hundred fishes, and someone somewhere is gonna click on one of them, and then we're gonna get in, and we often measure um, time to domain admin in hours. So once we get on your machine, it's just a matter of time before we open the whole thing. Um, oh, um, so you might say, what about phishing training? Uh, those have a little bit of impact, uh, but there's a Vanderbilt study that found that training had almost no impact. So it does reduce it a little bit, but it's kind of negligible. So you can't train users to not click fishes because it's a numbers game. You know, all I need is one user to click. So if you're having a bad day, if you haven't had your coffee when you read the email, like everyone has a bad day, it just takes one user for me to get in. Um, and some of the fishes I've sent, like I would fall for them. And, and like I'm supposed to be on guard for these things. So um, just saying like if, if we're attacking users, users are a soft target. Um, then we can also attack the passwords themselves. So we can use password spraying, credential stuffing, brute forcing. Um, because um, again, if you've got a thousand people in your company, I just need one password. So someone somewhere might have winter 2021 exclamation point as a password. And then I get in. So that makes them an easy target. So, what about MFA? So, this is also good to enable. If you, I'm not saying don't use MFA. Use MFA, please. Use password managers, please. Um, but, I'm sure you've heard of SIM swapping attacks where people target, you know, if you've got a bunch of crypto on, on, your, on your Coinbase app, they'll target this guy's phone because he's got crypto, and they'll do a swim, SIM swap attack, attack so they can log into your Coinbase account. Um, and I've tested at least like three or four um, implementations of MFA this year that allowed me to brute force the MFA token. So I couldn't brute force the password. They said, oh, three tries and you're out. Um, but if I had a valid username and password, it would let me roll through a million yeses on the MFA token until I got it. So poor implementation of MFA could still be uh, a target for me. Um, and like I said, MFA is not vulnerable, or not invulnerable to phishing attacks. So how would this look? We've got Alice, she's got her phone to receive her MFA token, and she wants to go to a site. Well, me being the bad guy, I'm gonna put a man in the middle site in between her and her real site. I'm gonna send her an email that says, hey, you know, your Okta credential is bad, you need to update it, or whatever the email says. Convince her to visit my email site, She's gonna enter her username, and I'm gonna give that to the real site. She's gonna enter her password, and I'm gonna give that to the real site. But she's got an MFA going, so it's gonna send the MFA token to her phone. And she's gonna put it into my site, and I'm gonna give it to the real site, and guess what? I'm logged in as Alice now. Um, and we, we actually did this uh, recently. We, we targeted Okta, so I wanted to give you a quick demo of like a man-in-the-middle attack against Okta.com. So, okay, this is where, this is the new demo I added, so this is where everything's gonna crash and burn, so <laughs> get your popcorn ready. Um, so I've got uh, Okta, trustfoundry.okta.com. Also, you get to type one-handed when you're holding a microphone, so that's fun. So I, I, I got an Okta trial, and I set up real users on Okta.com. So this is pretend like Trust Foundry is using Okta. We're not, so if you try to hack us, whatever. Um, but this is actual Okta, like we created real accounts on Okta.com. Let's say I'm targeting, I'm an evil guy, and I want to target Okta. So I set up a server, we call it Evil Genix. This thing is awesome if you haven't played with it. It uh, makes it really easy to spin up man in the middle servers. And so I created, I bought a domain called id-okta.com and I set EvilGenix up at trustfoundry-id.okta.com. And so now I'm going to email a user at Trust Foundry and get him to visit this evil site. But don't worry, I've got, I've got 
you know, MFA on there, so I'm, my users are safe, right? Uh, here's the URL that I'm going to send to my unsuspecting victim. And so, first thing I want you to notice this is id octa.com. If my user misses that ID, like, which is a very good chance he will, uh, he's not going to notice that this is a fake site. Also, I want you to notice how similar they look because they are the same site. I'm passing information straight through. Like, so it's identical to the site he visited. Uh, and Matt's the user, he's got MFA enabled. He's going to sign in. Dun, dun, dun. So back here on my evil genetics, it shows me his username and password. As an attacker, I don't really care about that because he's got MFA. But you'll notice here it's prompting him for MFA. So I gotta log in real quick. Nope. Don't worry, this is not the part where I crash and burn. So he's logged in with his MFA token, and that gets passed through my evil site to ID or to the real Octa. At this part, I, I didn't set it up yet. You could either redirect him to a page that says password not valid. It normally redirects them to the actual Octa.com, but Octa just recently added some protections to prevent that. Um, so it's in an infinite loop. But as an attacker, I don't care because I have his session back here that says all authorization tokens have been intercepted. So I'm going to look at my sessions. Um, right now, there's my Matt South user that I targeted. I'm going to get his session token. Um, if I can read. And I'm going to take his session token and I'm going to put it into my evil browser, like my attacker browser, and I'm going to log in. Hold on. I'm going to go to the real octa.com, the trustfoundry.octa.com, and I'm going to try to, like, I'm an evil guy, I'm not, well, crap, I can't lock this. Here, let me sign out. <laughs> I've been practicing this at home, so I won't lock this. Okay, so I'm, this is my evil browser, and I'm going to put that session token that I just jacked from, from this unsuspecting victim in here. So this is a cookie editor um, plugin for Chrome. I'm going to paste this session token. So this is what I'm actually after as an attacker. When I save it and refresh the page, I am that user. So evil guy stole your cookie, and now I'm into your Okta. And if you've got AWS in your Okta, or you've got Coinbase in your Okta, or whatever you've got in your Okta, I've got all of your cookies. And so even with MFA, an attacker can still fish you and still get the goodies. Um, hey, I didn't crash and burn. That, that was the demo that kept me up last night. So, um, this is a quote from some fancy pants Microsoft guy, and essentially what he's saying is, with passwords, we put the onus of protecting your organization on the users. And users have bad days. Users can pick dumb passwords. Users are not security experts like us. So it can put your organization at risk. And, and, and we try to make it their fault. We're like, oh, that idiot didn't change your password, or that idiot did something wrong. They're people. Like, we're, we're, we're asking people to protect organizations, and pre people can mess up. Um, and even us as security guys, we make mistakes too. Like, I fall for fishes, and, and I, I get tricked sometimes too. So, WebAuthn to the rescue. Dun, 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 dun. WebAuthn uses public key um, exchange, public-private key exchange. Um, who, who, who knows everything there is to know about public-private key exchange? Who wants to explain it? Just joking, me either. Um, so, public-private key exchange is complicated, but I want I want to bring Alice back. I want to like do a little high-level refresher on why why this is good and why why we want it. So, Alice wants to SSH to Bob.com. But she's smart and she knows how to use SSH keygen to generate herself a public and private key pair. So Alice, when she sets up an account on Bob.com, she's like, hey Bob.com, this is my SSH public key. 
This contains no information about Alice. This contains no passwords, public keys you can give to anyone you want. But they, Bob.com can use this to validate signatures from Alice. So if they send Alice a challenge and she signs it with her private key, they can use the public key to say, Alice for sure signed this. So it's like a signature validation thing. So when Alice comes back later, she says, hey, I'm back. Bob.com is like, nice try. Sign this and prove that you're Alice. And Alice says, okay, here's that, that challenge. I signed it. And Bob.com uses the public key to say, okay, cryptogra cryptographically validated that you are who you said you are. And so this is awesome. This is way more protection than uh, normal passwords. It's got increased security, um, but not everyone is walking around with public private key pairs. Not everyone knows how to use SSH keygen to make those, those key pairs, or do they? So there are a lot of places that you are walking around today with public private key pairs, you just don't know it. So, CTAP and FIDO, um, YubiKeys, have you heard of YubiKeys? Those are little public private key pairs. Uh, Windows Hello, which is uh, the TPM on Windows that pops up and says, hey, swipe your fingerprint. That like it has public private key pair magic happening in the background. And even your swipe on your phone, like your, your fingerprints on your phone. So oftentimes, we're already using this, but that is for specific device, like specific circumstances. It doesn't translate to eBay.com. It doesn't translate to Facebook.com. So what WebAuthn is trying to do to use this technology that we're already using on the sites we visit every day. So how are we going to do that? Alice is back. We're going to take her public private key pair that she's walking around with, and we're going to give her a little authenticator device that she can unlock with her fingerprint. Um, and it's the same conversation as before, but Alice doesn't have to be a security expert and know how to use SSH keygen to get this going. Um, Okay, so how is this gonna look to Alice? Like when she goes to eBay.com, like what's gonna happen when she, when she tries to sign in? Well, I'm glad you asked because I set up WebAuthn on eBay.com. And so normally when you visit eBay.com, you have to open your password vault and you have to type in your 54 character password. I've set up WebAuthn here I visited the site already. It's like, hey, Maddie and Fatty, welcome back. You want to sign in? I'm like, sure, I do want to sign in. And my TPM platform on Windows is like, hey, give me your fingerprint. I'm like, all right. Woo. Oh, wait. Woo. And that's it. Did I have to type a 52 character password? Did I have to do anything special? No. And this is more secure because it's a public private key that just happened. So I bet if an attacker is trying to attack that, he's trying to attack that and not my imagination or my creativity when it comes to making a password. Um, so, I hope you can see that that was very easy for me to sign in. Like it made, it's less friction on the user, so that's what I wanted to show there. Quick question, if there wasn't already a user cookie set, you would have had to put in your username? Yes. And then you would have? Yes, and it recognized that I had already visited. Traditionally, so the question was, if, 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 the, if it didn't remember me, how would this look to the user? I would have to type in my username, and then it would say, okay, Matt, swipe your fingerprint. So there would have been a, a, a field where you type in your username. Good question. Other question? So this seems very relevant for user accounts. I'm curious if there's an application for service accounts or non-interactive accounts. Um, the question was, this is good for user accounts, but not. Uh, what, how is it going to look for service account or non-interactive accounts? That is a really good question. Um, it's going to be, so the, the purpose of it is mainly for like web applications, like where you would use password authentication. A service account might, on the web might be for like an API maybe or something on the back end. Um, in which case you could use, I don't know if WebAuthn would be a good fit for that because um, it's mainly for users. It's, it's designed to get users into sites easily. If you're designing an API, you could already design it to use public or private keys or you could already use like a, 200 character long random string, so it's um, it's easier for the machine to, to, to use it securely. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. Any other questions? Your service account is not going to get fished. So. Oh yeah, good point. The service account isn't going to get fished. That's a good point. Um, okay, so if if we're uh, 
Let's pretend that you're in charge of the whole internet and you're trying to make web off end work. Who needs to be involved? Like, who are the players that we need to bring to the table to get this to work? Any guesses? Me. You? You are, um, how about an app developer? So the people making the sites. Yes. Who else needs to be involved? Uh, someone said browsers? Browsers, yes. <laughs> browsers, need to, browser manufacturers need to be in on this. And like he said, the app developers, so site owners need to be in on this. And then um, the OS people, so the fact that Microsoft popped up and said, hey, swipe your fingerprint, they need to be involved. And if, if there's any hardware involved, so the device manufacturers or the fingerprint guys, they need to be involved. So we've got all the players at the table. Um, in FIDO2 slash web off inland, we call these the authenticator. So the hardware platform guys are the authenticator. The client is the browser. And then the relying party is the site that's trying to like rely on this authentication. Um, so how are these guys going to talk to each other? So we've got something called the web off in API. Um, to confuse things, which I'll get into later, there's another web off in API. But this is a browser to website API, and it's in JSON format usually. Um, we had to create new, I say we, I have no, I, I have no part of this. There's new JavaScript functions that needed to be created for the browsers to call authenticator functions. And then there's another WebAuthn API, which when you're trying to research and make a talk about WebAuthn, and I keep talking about two different APIs, it's very confusing, but this is like an OS level API, so think like JavaScript, or Java API, or like C API. So this is an API for how browsers can talk to platforms and operating systems. And then uh, CTAP2 is a uh, a standardization for uh, made by the FIDO Alliance um, that's already in use that is a, a, a way to use authenticator devices. So it's like a standard for, for how to talk authenticator talk. And um, the, I'm going to use the words FIDO2 and, and WebAuthn and, and CTEP. So the FIDO2 is the, is the hardware people. Well, FIDO2 is hardware plus WebAuthn API. So FIDO2 is going to be the whole thing. Um, CTAP is the hardware stuff, and uh, like WebAuthn is the web stuff. And so um, CTAP 2 on the hardware side supports uh, new features over and above CTAP 1. Specific, so CTAP 1 is the UV keys that you're used to, like where you plug it in and just tap it, and it does some, some magic and wants other things. CTAP 2 added the, the user verification, so a fingerprint or a PIN number, so it's got additional features on top. It also stores your private key locally, so no sense of the data is ever sent from the authenticator. It has the option for extensions, which will allow for further improvements down the road. It's compatible with existing TPM models like Microsoft Hello, and it's also backwards compatible with CTAP1, so if you can use your YubiKey to authenticate to eBay if you wanted to, because it's backwards compatible. Um, and I kind of mentioned this, WebAuthn lives in the W3 W3C spec, so WebAuthn was designed by the browser guys and the website guys. Um, CTAP2 was the hardware guys, and FIDO2 is kind of WebAuthn and CTAP. So if you see these acronyms flying around, I just want to, I had to like untangle all that, so I want to help untangle it for you. Or maybe I tangled it more if I don't know. Um, so there's two general commands. Like when you visit a site, you're like, hey, I'm new to eBay, I want to, I want to register. So there's a register user command, and then when you come back, you're like, hey, I'm Matt, I want back in. There's an authenticate user command. So those are the two high-level commands. Um, and this is just like passwords. This is what you're doing already, except when you register a user, you'll register an authentication device and not a password. Um, so how is this going to work? This is where we get technical. So um, if you want to like get out your phone and think about something else while I'm in the weeds, um, go for it. I won't be insulted. Um, but this is where you're going to look at JSON blobs and your eyes are going to roll in the back of your head. Um, but Matt visits a site and he says, hey, I'm new to eBay, I want to create a new account. The site responds with this big JSON blob and I'm going to tell you what all of this is. This is a challenge that it wants you to sign um, for the first time. And this ID is the domain. This is important because this is what prevents phishing with WebAuthn. So that domain name, webauthn.io, is going to match the domain that you're on in the browser. So if it's webauthn-evil.io, it's not going to match. 
hatch. So this is super important right there for fishing. Further down in the JSON blob, um, the, the site's saying, I, these are, this is a list of the algorithms that I accept. Um, and usually there's a, about a dozen or two dozen algorithms there. Um, this authenticator selection, most of it, most sites aren't going to care about this stuff, but if you're like in a high security type situation, you can specify these are the type of authenticators that I will accept to authenticate to this site. Um, authentication attachment can be platform, cross-platform, or unspecified. A platform authenticator is like Microsoft Hello that you saw earlier. Cross-platform is like uh, these like USB keys that you would plug into your device. And then unspecified means it take anything. Require a resident key. Um, I think that's that's a setting to where it will remember your username, so you don't even have to type in a username. Um, user verification. Those options are um, preferred, discouraged, or required. Um, and that user verification can take the form of a PIN number or a fingerprint swipe or like a face scan. It somehow verifies the user before it unlocks the private keys. Um, and this is an advancement over normal CTAP that I mentioned. Timeout down here is pretty self-explanatory. This is how long the authenticator, the relying party will wait for you to authenticate. And then this is extensions down here, where uh, hopefully in the future people will be building out cool like additional features, but there's nothing there yet. Um, and attestation, this one's confusing, so we'll talk about that later. It's later. What the heck is attestation? <laughs> So, uh, a successful registration ceremony always returns an attestation object. When it confused me at first, because I understood as I was researching, attestation is a way to verify the device that you're using. So you can attest, so an example is, um, all Samsung Galaxy 8 phones that were manufactured at a certain date at a certain facility, they are, they have an attestation like uh, certificate that you can verify, like this is verifiably a Samsung 8 phone that was used to authenticate. So you can attest, like it's, it's validating the validators. It's a verification of the authentication object. But what confused me, like I would, I would always select none for attestation because I, as I was playing around, I didn't want attestation because that's, that's for a high security type situation. Like if you're Department of Defense or something, you want, to, you want only certain authenticators to authenticate to your site. Um, so I was always selecting none as I was testing and playing around. But I kept seeing this attestation object coming back. I was like, no, I said, no attestation, attestation. Come to find out, the attestation object is the public key that gets sent to the site when you're first signing up. So there's attestation object, which is different than the attestation option, just to confuse everyone. Um, hopefully that cleared it up, but hopefully it confused more. Um, so that was when I registered for an account. Um, that, that was coming from the website. Now your browser has to do some work. So you said, hey, I'm a new user. What, what languages do you speak site? And the site's like, I can do this. So now, you're, now your client, your browser, calls navigator.credential.create. And also, when it's calling that, it matches up the origin from where you're talking to to the credential that you're creating. Um, and then this will start when it calls navigator.credential.create, it's like, hey Windows, hey Mac, or whatever. Fire up your Windows Hello or your TPM or whatever to authenticate this user. So the user will get a little pop-up, they will swipe their fingerprint, and it's funny, when you swipe the fingerprint, they call it an authentication ceremony. So like every time I'm like doing this, I, I imagine like being in church or something like, oh, 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 oh. I think they like ran out of words to call things. Like it's not a tap, it's not a swipe, it's not a click. Oh, what is it? We're out of stuff to call it. How about a ceremony? So <laughs> authentication ceremony. So if, on, on the example I showed when, I, when, it, when the user got a pop up, the user scans their fingerprint and does the ceremony. Your browser says navigator.credential create. I want to create a new credential. The OS gives the browser this information. So what is this information? The operating system creates a GUID for the new public-private key pair that it just generated. So it's like, here's this GUID. It, um, this is the attestation object that confuses everyone. But this is just the, private, the public key. So it's like, here's Alice's public key, and 
here's the GUID, here's what you're going to call this key, here's what the key is, and also here's a little information about the authenticator I used to create that key. Um, so, let's demo this. Another demo. I'm, I'm a glutton for pain. Uh, I have Burp Suite, which some of you are familiar with. Um, this is a web uh, HTTP proxy so I can see the traffic and tell you what's going on. I'm going to go to webauthn.io. Um, this is a site, I don't know who made it, but it is awesome and you can play around with it. It's like a web authentic playground. You can like probably go there on your phones now if you want. Um, but it has two functions. It lets you create accounts and lets you log into accounts. There's nothing behind the login. It's just like to see web authentic happening. So I'm going to create a new user, Matty McFetty. Um, this attestation type and authenticator type and these advanced settings, these are normally set by the site that you would visit. So a user normally doesn't get to choose all this. Normally the site's like, here's what I'll talk. So we're going to leave these alone. But in the playground, it lets you set all this stuff so that you can create a user with these settings. But normally, the user wouldn't, wouldn't pick any of this stuff. The site speaks what it speaks. So I'm going to register a new user. Hold up. What just happened? So I got a pop up. How did this happen? So I'm going to show you what it looks like in our HTTP proxy. Uh, right here, my browser said, hey, I want to create a new user called Maddie McFadden. And the site responded with this. Let me make it a little bigger for you. Which is the, what I just described to you. So it says, here's a challenge. Here's the ID of the site that I want a new credential for. Here's the username. Here's the languages I speak as far as crypto languages. And here's the authenticator types that I'll accept. And also you have 60,000 milliseconds to do it. Um, then my browser called navigator.credentialcreate using this information that was from the site. So I said, hey browser, or browser said, hey operating system, create me a new credential. And that's when we got this pop-up. So navigator.credentialcreate, pop-pop. This is saying, hey, this wants to create a new key. Swipe your fingerprint and make a new key. So I'm going to swipe. I now have a new public-private key stored in my TPM. My window's hella. Um, and, oh, sorry, there's one more thing that I want to show you. After I made the credential, so this came from the operating system, and I'm sending it to the site. So I'm like, hey site, I created a new credential, here's this big long ID, and here's this attestation object that confuses everyone, and also here's some information about the, the authenticator that I'm using. So, it, from now on, the site, will, when, when Matt comes back, it's going to say, oh, you're Matt? Well, look up this, this private key for this ID and sign this challenge. So it's going to use this information when Matt comes back. OK, so what does Matt coming back look like in the weeds? So Matt's back. He says, hey, I want back in, created the credential. The server's going to say, okay, this is a shorter response because it doesn't have to say all the algorithm and all this other stuff. The server's going to say, okay, great, you're Matt. You should have this ID that you gave me. So look in your TPM for this ID when you register and sign this challenge using your private key to prove that you're Matt. And then my browser is going to say navigator.credential get instead of create. So it's going to say, give me this credential. And this will call the CTAP2 API from our operating system and, and pull the credential. And that's when I'll get that little pop up to swipe my fingerprint. Um, my, the operating system is going to give back to my browser this information, which it'll say, hey, that ID, I found it. For this ID, here's a cryptographic signature. So there's my signature that proves I'm Matt. You have the public key. Go ahead and validate that. I am who I say I am. And also, here's a little information about the authenticator I used. And so let's see that. So back here on webauthn.io, I created a Manny McFadden account. I'm going to log in. Pop, pop, wait, what's going on? Let's see. So it says, get me Manny McFadden. And it says, cool, Manny McFadden has this challenge, or this is the challenge I wanted to sign. You guys can not see that. It doesn't matter. It's all gibberish. Um, it's like big, long characters that don't mean anything. Um, 
and this is the domain that you're on, and here's the key ID that I want you to sign up with. So sign this challenge with this key. And then my browser called navigator.credential git popped up a thing for me. I'm going to swipe my fingerprint, and I'm in. And so what happened there? From my operating system, it said, okay, I found that ID. Uh, here is the signature, so I signed your challenge, and also here's some information about the authenticator that I used. So the site said, over here, signature verified, come on in, man. So like, it used the public key it already has to, val to ver verify that signature on that challenge. Uh, okay, we're done with the boring stuff. So you can come back to Earth. Come back to Earth. <laughs> um, so I heard one uh, talk on this. The, the, the speaker called Web Authent is a unicorn. I was like, why are they calling it a unicorn? He said, for, mo for security for most things, as things get more secure, there's more friction for the user. So it's harder for the user. Think of like MFA tokens. Like you're like, oh crap, where's my phone? Like you gotta pull your phone out. Then you're like, which authenticator was that? Because I got like six on my phone now. And so like, it, there's more friction for the user. Imagine your front door with a lock that had like six locks. Like how long would that take you to get through? So more secure usually means more friction. WebAuthn, on the other hand, is more secure than passwords and easier than passwords. So it, it's a unicorn. It, it makes it less friction for the user, but you're using public and private keys, so it, it's more secure. Um, and it's phishing resistant. So here's some MFA options in order of increasing security, but like I showed with Alice, these can all be phished. Like if they're entered in out of band, they can accidentally be entered into a phishing site. Um, these, on the other hand, are harder to fish. So there's UV keys and the web off biometric keys. Um, and there's no, because of that route, because of that ID, the browser's enforcing like, hey, you're not on Okta.com. You're on ID.Okta.com. So the browser's enforcing the domain. So I can't trick anything here as an attacker. So I want to show you one last demo. This is the last one, I promise. I'm like addicted to demos today. Um, let's go back to uh, that evil site that I set up. I think, can we press that? So I, I set up two users on Okta.com. One user I set up with MFA, and you saw him log in, you saw him get fished. I set up a second user using WebAuthn. Traditionally on sites, WebAuthn is supposed to be like the primary authentication mechanism. Okta has it as an as a MFA option. So normally, you wouldn't need a username and password, but Okta has it as a, like a second factor of authentication. But it, it's fine. I wanted to show you it in, in, in action. So I'm on evilokta.com. This is id-okta.com. And on my evil Genix site, it's like, oh, you got a new user coming in. So let me enter in his username and password. And it's like, oh, you got a security biometric thing happening. And on Evilgenix, got his username, I got his password, yes! Uh, but notice what it's saying here. It's like, hey, um, I'm looking for a key for id-octa.com. I don't got it. Plug in your UBT or wherever this thing is, because I don't have it. The, the, my, my Windows Hello, my TPM does not have a key for id-octa.com. And, and there's no way for it to, like, unless I set up Unless I set up the user on id-octa.com, there's no, there's no key in there. So the only button I can press is cancel, and then Octa's like, you, uh, you're not getting in. We actually had an engagement where we were doing this Octa fish, and the, the system admin or the CSO or whatever was like, hey, this web authentic technology, it'd be a good idea for everyone to get up, get on this web authentic technology. And he did that two weeks before our penetration test. And I'm like, oh, okay. Great. So he, he had all his users switch to WebAuthn before I tried to fish his organization. It was hilarious. Um, he studied for the test. That's what we call it. He studied for that test, didn't you? Um, luckily, they had fallback mechanisms. Like, like if 
the fingerprint didn't work in the user phone or something else, so there was fallback mechanisms. Um, okay, so let's talk about some pros and cons. I kind of hammered the nail that it's breach resistant. It's, uh, well, I didn't hammer that nail. Breach resistant means if your site gets hacked, I dump all your users and all their credentials. Um, with WebAuthn, all I have is a public key. Who cares if I have 400 public keys? It's public information. It doesn't do me any good as an attacker. So if your site gets breached, you're on have I been owned, it doesn't matter. It's like there's no, there's no, nothing good there. Um, also, it's based on strong crypto that we're already using, public private key exchange, it's, it's time tested crypto. And this means attackers are attacking math. So I'm not attacking your creativity on making like a complex password. I'm attacking math. And that's much harder for me to attack. Um, also, uh, it's reverse compatible to 501. So you can use YubiKeys and stuff with this. One word of caution though, if you are using YubiKeys, I would recommend, you know, if, if you lose, if you if you switch to WebAuthn for all your accounts and you're just using a normal YubiKey, um, if you lose that, there's no user verification, there's no PIN. So if people get your YubiKey, they can get into all your YubiKeys. So I would recommend if you do switch over, even though it's reverse compatible, I would recommend getting like a FIDO2, like a WebAuthn device. Um, and um, all major browsers are already supported. This is already, like your browser already has this ready to rock, your operating system already has this ready to rock, it's already here. Just a matter of the site starting to support it and users switching over. Um, and there's platform support, so Mac, iPhone, um, Windows, Android, they all support it. So cons, your device can be lost or stolen. Imagine you've got your laptop and your fingerprint scanner set up with all these sites, and then someone steals your laptop. You're up, you're up a creek. The official recommendation is that you authentic, you, you register multiple authenticators. So ideally, you know, five years from now, when we're all using WebAuthn, we'll have you know our home laptop, our work laptop, and our phone, and one of these like T authenticators all registered to your site. But that brings me to a second con because it's it's costly. These authenticators, these uh, USB keys, cost about forty bucks, give or take. Um, laptops have to be new enough to have a fingerprint scanner. Um, 40 bucks doesn't sound like a lot to us, but think of someone from like a, a third world country or something. 40 bucks can be a lot. And if you're saying you need two of them for each site you visit in case you lose one, that can, that can be exclusive to some people. And I haven't heard anyone talking about this, but there could be legal implications, meaning under the Fifth Amendment, you can't be compelled to share your password because it would be self-incriminating. But you can be compelled to share a fingerprint or some other biometric thing. So I'm not a lawyer. I have no idea what I'm talking about. But if all of your stuff is fingerprint enabled and you can just swipe in with a fingerprint, there may be a way for law enforcement to compel that um, access to that. So that's another thing to consider. Um, what sucks for me is WebAuthn makes it harder for bad guys. So now I'm fighting crypto, like I said, instead of grandma's creativity. I'm not, uh, there's no more hash passwords to dump, so when I get SQL injection, I'm like, yes, I got the whole database. Oh, it's all, it's all public keys, who cares? So, and no more phishing. The, you, I showed you what happens when I try to fish, it just stops me. And so it's a very sad day in Hacker Town. Um, so what does this mean for the future? I'm gonna act like I'm like an industry expert or something to predict what this means for the future. Actually, I just stole these ideas from other people that are smarter than me. Um, normally, we fish a credential to get into your organization. And so, phishing has been on the rise, especially as cloud, ah, cloud I said cloud, drink, um, especially as cloud stuff is, is more and more popular. So like, I'm not really, I don't really care about getting into your, onto your laptop. I really care about getting into your AWS or into your um, Okta or something like that. Um, so phishing on the rise now, but if everyone switches to WebAuthn, I think, um, all work could be on the rise. So like people will be, okay, well everyone's got these authenticators, let's try to get on the machine and try to get in the middle of authentication in that way. Um, and there's some barriers to widespread adoption, like I said, cost. Um, and then as I was testing, I RDP'd into my Windows, like it was like, oh, I, you're in an RDP session, like WebAuthn is not a thing, like there's no USB device, so we're gonna have to figure out RDP and media type situations. Um, great potential for innovation and adoption. Um, this is a disruptive technology. We all know passwords. We've been using passwords since the internet's been a thing. Um, so I think there is there's a need for some disruption here. 
there. So I think it's going to take off. Um, and there's potential that, especially with the fact that they have it extensible. So like, if you think of something cool that you can add to WebAuthn to improve it, there's space for it to be improved. Um, I think I think that's everything. So I've got um, I reached out to this company, Baiten, I think they're called, and I was like, hey, I'm giving this talk. Will you give me some keys and I'll throw them to people if they're brave enough to ask a question? And um, <laughs> I, I don't get paid by these people, so I have no relationship with them. They were just being really chill and giving me keys. So if you got questions, go ahead and ask them. I think we already had a couple of people ask questions. Do you want a key? All right. Come up and come up and grab a key if you already asked a question. Um, but yeah, who's got other questions? Hit me. So how do you, the question is, how do you protect just the thumbprint, if that's what because, it is? Uh, so what my understanding is, is like once you, you can't change your thumbprint. Right. right. So once it gets compromised, then you can't change it. Right. And then you can't change it. No matter what you use for a PC, does it use the same algorithm? So it's generates the same number for your thumb different, no matter what? Good question. So his question is like, if I get compromised, I can't chop off my thumb and get a new thumb. What does that mean for WebAuthn? Well, the thumbprint just unlocks your authenticator device. So you can use a thumbprint, you can use a PIN number, uh, iPhone has the facial ID stuff. So all that is, is a way of, like if your laptop gets stolen, if your phone gets lost, it's a way of keeping your private keys private to prevent other people from authenticating as you. So the, the sites don't have your thumbprints, no one really has your thumbprint, it kind of stays on the device. So imagine like, um, if you have a YubiKey and you're using that to log into everything, but there's no thumbprint validation, if you lose that key, I can just plug it into my machine, go to facebook.com, I'm, I'm in as you. But with a thumbprint or with a facial ID, there's another hurdle for me to get over in order to unlock that device to get in as you. So it's just a way to protect the authenticator device. Has there been any testing that suggests that people can steal your thumbprint off the digital signature and thumbprint off the machine? So the question is, is there any, like, like could someone steal my thumbprint and unlock the device? That's a manufacturer, like a hardware to hardware, manufacturer to manufacturer kind of thing. So it depends. I imagine, like, as I was doing this research, I'm like, how do I attack this? I think people might start, like, if there's a UBT or something that's very popular, they might start targeting that and find, try to find a weakness or some sort of flaw with the way that hardware is set up to try and get it to dump your keys or try to get it, trick it into unlocking when it's not really your thumbprint or something like that. Um, so, yeah, it would be a, a hard work by a hard work kind of thing. Come, come grab a, one of these. Who else? This guy's had his hand up in the back for a long time. Yeah. So regarding that presentation, can you define, is it a reliant party to define some arbitrary uh, specific device that you designed yourself to at least show that your packets are, uh, or at least that, that, that initial query as part of that, that pack initial could you set something arbitrary in there so that you could say, oh, I don't want UDP, I don't want CAC or TIB or whatever, I don't want that to be I want this weird thing that you made yourself so that way you can make sure that no one else can even try and report this at all. So his question was about attestation, like could I make my own attestation object? I don't know. So attestation is like a, a certificate, like when you're manufacturing something. Um, I would imagine, I don't know that there's like some sort of central attestation repository anywhere. I think it's, or maybe there might be. Um, I don't know enough about it to answer that question intelligently. But I don't, I don't think, like if, let's say it's not you trying to create one for yourself. Let's say you're a small business trying to get going. Am I allowed to play too? Can I create an attestation certificate? I think the answer would have to be yes. I think you should be able to play and create your own devices. So I don't know exactly how it works, but I think the answer to your question is yes. You should be able to create an attestation signature for you, for Bill's thumbprint scanner or whatever. Like you should be able to do that. Yes. Yeah, since, since, since you're already using it to say you only allow certain devices, I, I figured maybe you can have another new device. Yeah, that's a good idea. Come get a, come get a little thing, Bill. Ma Maticus? Yeah, you remember. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, is there an easy way for uh, website owners to just like plug and play, switch over authentication? Like, is that built yet, or or is it? Um, I mean, obviously, it's going to differ how they authenticate, right? But like, how prohibitive is it for website owners to implement this technology? So, Manicus's question is, how hard is this going to be for web owners to switch over? I don't know. I would have to imagine it depends on your framework. So if you're using Node or something, I would imagine that there's like a Node web authn module that you can install. Um, but it would depend a lot on your framework. Um, hopefully it's easier than passwords because you're not storing all the hashes and the blah, 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 blah. So hopefully it's easier, but I don't, I don't, know. I don't know for sure. Come get a, come get a guy. Uh, would a more complicated command and level like that be able to like say you already registered with the site, you put some magic in there, um, and then make it look like you're having to re-register with the site. So, so the question is, would a more complex man-in-the-middle attack work? And I, when that company switched everything over to WebAuthn right before I pen tested it, I was like racking my brain, like how am I going to attack this? Only thing I, because it's the domain, so evilocta.com. I don't have a key for that. I'd have to like trick them into registering on evilocta.com first, and then when they come back, I'd have to trick them into going back there to re to reauthenticate. Um, I could not think of a good way. The one thing that I came up with, I was like, what if I what if I mailed them like crappy authenticator devices, and it's like the same private key for every request, like it just gives the same response or something. I wonder if I could like trick them into using that to authenticate to Octa.com. That's the only way I can think of it. But it, and it, that would be a hard, like, I think, to answer that question, you'd be attacking the hardware weakness. You'd be attacking the weakness with one of these authenticators or something. Yeah, that, that, these are all, these are all backdoor. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be my question. Should you ever take a USB from a pen test? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you're all gonna get more. Um, this guy over here, one of these two guys? So, Paper, rock, scissors. So I have, uh, at my job, I have my user account, and I have some admin account. And because of web controls, I need to do certain things. I only use one browser for my user, and I only use a different browser for my admin. I see where you're going. If I go through all the process of getting web authn set up, I'm technically going to have a key tied to that browser. So his question is, what if I got one machine and like multiple accounts for the same site, for the same thing? So like, if I've got an admin user and a regular user that I need to log, log into, great question. Um, each time you register, you tell it this username, so you're gonna tell it the username when you're registering that device, and each time you create a new key pair, it gives you a random ID. So when you come back in and say, okay, I'm not, I'm not Matt, I'm admin, going to say, well, I have a key for admin, and this is the GUID, so give me that private, like, sign using that GUID. So it's perfectly fine to be able to do what you ask. Go ahead and get, get yourself a key. So, um, does this, like, does, like, the hardware part of this, not the web off part, or I guess I'm kind of the web off part, does that work with, like, signing to applications or, like, web apps that are not going to use the browser? Like, maybe Steam? I can't think of so the question is, using, using this with something that doesn't use a browser. Um, that is a great question that I haven't thought about. Um, it's designed, again, for like users using a browser to log into web apps, so it's like a web app user kind of thing. Um, I don't think there would be anything that prohibits like Steam or some sort of thick client from using this technology, so it shouldn't be prohibitive. What I'm thinking is, the standard that's like security people created and stuff. Like if Steam is doing their own, or like if I build an app, I'm an idiot. If I'm like, well, I gotta implement this web off end stuff, like there might be a, uh, it might be ripe for errors if I'm like doing it myself. So there might be problems there. But I think it could be done. I don't know. We got one left up there if you wanna grab it. I'm out, I'm out of uh, tease, but if anyone else has any questions, they were like, I don't have questions now. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? Yeah, I mean, this is just like everything else. It's only as good as your like, backup recovery process. So yeah. I assume because you have to, if you're a web, like, you have an awesome 
Yeah. 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 So his question was, uh, what about backup recovery stuff? And I think I had notes in here to talk about it in my slide, but I was nervous and I skipped over it. Um, the, the recommendations are, you can, so the, the ideal recommendation is to have more than one authenticator, like I mentioned, which is, yeah. Um, do a normal pass, forgot password type thing, like my dog ate my authenticator, and you can do a forgot password where they would email you a magic link, that's the second best. Um, what I read time and time again was, do not fall back to passwords. Because <laughs> if you're like, I forgot my authenticator. Cool, what's your password? Then an attacker's just gonna say, I forgot my, I forgot his authenticator too. So you're just attacking passwords. <laughs> so, uh, don't fall back to passwords. Anything else? We're almost, we're almost lunchtime. Vectors to steal the private key off the client. And I was thinking a lot about that when I had that situation. I'm like, how am I gonna break this? And what I came to is it's gonna be hardware to hard, manufacturer to manufacturer type situation. These keys were very easy for me to break into and change the keys before I gave them to all of you guys. Um, no, I'm just I literally did not do anything for these. Like, I'm, I'm not that smart. Um, it, would, it would depend on the hardware information. And so I would think that Windows and TPM and, and I, I, iOS and, and all that would, would be, be pretty well protected against attacks like that. But this is a brand new technology, so this is kind of uncharted water. So if you want to try to break in and steal people's private keys, that might be a good area of research. So let's go to lunch. <laughs> Thank you.